Hi everyone, welcome back. If you are new, please consider subscribing. My name is Yadi and I make educational videos for beauty professionals in training and for everyone who likes to continue learning. In today's video, this is a big one, you guys. We are going to be doing a full theory review over infection control. So if you clicked on this video, that means that you're either an esthetician, a cosmetologist, a nail technician, an eyelash specialist, or a barber, or just anyone who is interested in learning and knowing more about infection control. As you guys know, this is extremely, extremely important in our industry, infection control, definitely starts with us and knowing everything that we need to do to take care of ourselves and our clients. It's going to be a long video, but I promise you, you do not want to skip any of this information. If you are here because you are studying for your state board exam, please, please, please make sure you stay until the very end. It is extremely important that you know all of this information, not just for your test, but also to carry with you throughout your career. Now let's get started. Explain infection control. State boards and other regulatory agencies require that infection control measures and safe work practices be applied while serving the public. Infection control refers to the methods used to eliminate or reduce the transmission of infectious organisms from one individual to another. Since transmission can occur when using contaminated implements, tools, or equipment, the performance of effective infection control procedures must be a top priority in the salon, spa, and barber shop. It is your responsibility as a beauty professional to use proper and effective infection control methods that help safeguard your health and the health of your clients. You are also responsible for employing safe work practices to help prevent accidents and injuries from occurring in the workplace. Now let's go over some infection control vocabulary. Before we discuss infection control and safe work practices, the terms cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, and sterilizing need to be properly differentiated. So let's start with cleaning. Cleaning is a mechanical process using soap and water or detergent and water to remove all visible dirt, debris, and many disease-causing germs. Cleaning also removes invisible debris that interferes with disinfection. Sanitizing is a chemical process for reducing the number of disease-causing germs on clean surfaces to a safe level. Infection control professionals consider sanitation to be a layperson's term or a product marketing term, preferring cleaning to describe the step before disinfecting. Next, we have disinfecting. Disinfecting, you guys, is a chemical process for use with non porous items that use specific products to destroy harmful organisms, including bacteria, viruses, and fungi, okay, except bacterial spores, on implements and environmental surfaces. And lastly, we have sterilizing. Sterilizing is the process that destroys all microbial life, including spores, generally with the use of something called an autoclave. Some of you may be wondering what does it mean when a bacteria has spores? Okay, so a spore is a cell that certain fungi or plants and bacteria produce. Spores are involved in a reproduction. Certain bacteria make spores as a way to defend themselves, and spores have thick walls. Don't forget that if you find this information helpful, to share with a friend. 
Describe federal and state regulatory agencies. Many federal and state agencies regulate the beauty and wellness professions. Federal agencies set guidelines for the manufacture of cells and use of equipment and chemical ingredients. These guidelines also monitor safety in the workplace and place limits on the types of services you can perform in a salon, spa, or barber shop. State agencies regulate licensing, enforcement, and your conduct when you are on the job. Federal Agencies Occupational Safety and Health Administration The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, was created as part of the U.S. Department of Labor to regulate and enforce safety and health standards to protect employees in the workplace. The standards set by OSHA are important to beauty professionals because of the products they use daily. OSHA standards address issues relating to the handling, mixing, storing, and disposing of products. General safety in the workplace and your right to know about any potentially hazards ingredients contained in the products and how to avoid these hazards. OSHA does this in part by requiring that chemical manufacturers and importers assess and communicate the potential hazards associated with their products through a safety data sheet, also known as SDS. An SDS is a 16-category standard format document that replaced the previously mandated MSDS or PSDS. Environmental Protection Agency. The Environmental Protection Agency, also known as EPA, registers all types of disinfectants sold and used in the United States. Disinfectants are chemical products that destroy most bacteria, excluding, meaning not including, spores. So, fungi and viruses on surfaces. It is against federal law to use any disinfecting product in a way contrary to the use indicated on its label. Before manufacturers can sell a product for disinfecting surfaces, tools, implements, or equipment, they must obtain an EPA registration number indicated on the product label by EPA register number. Usually it's in the back of the bottle near the manufacturer's name that certifies that the disinfected when used correctly will be effective against the pathogens listed on the label so be sure you read carefully for example clipper disinfectants must be approved by the epa for use with clippers in specific environments you guys such as barber shops or the manufacturer will be breaking federal law by marketing them as clipper disinfectants to the barber's market. This also means that if you do not follow the label's instructions for mixing, contact time, and the type of surface the disinfecting product can be used on, you are not complying with federal law. If there were any injury-related lawsuit, you could be held responsible. State Regulatory Agencies the state regulatory agencies exist to protect beauty professionals and their customers' health and safety during services. State regulatory agencies include licensing agencies, state boards, commissions, and health departments. Regulatory agencies require that everyone working with clients in a salon, spa, or barber shop follow specific procedures. Enforcement of the rules through inspections and investigations of consumers' complaints is also part of an agency's responsibilities. An agency can issue penalties against both owners and beauty professional. Penalties vary and include warnings, fines, probation, and suspension or revocation of licenses. It is vital that you understand and follow the laws and rules of your state at all times. Your professional reputation and your license and your client's safety depend on it. 
Laws and rules, what is the difference? Laws are written by both federal and state legislature to determine the scope of practice. What does the scope of practice mean? Well, it means what each license allows the holder, meaning you, to do and establishes guidelines for regulatory agencies to make rules. Laws are also called statutes. Rules and regulations are more specific than laws. The regulatory agency or the state board writes the rules and determines how the law must be applied. Rules establish specific standards of conduct and can be changed or updated frequently, which is why it is important that you are constantly checking with the state board to make sure that you are aware of any changes. It is the beauty professional's responsibility to be aware of any changes to the rules and regulations. Wow, I just said that. And to comply with them, ignorance of the law is not an acceptable reason or excuse for non-compliance. So be sure you don't get caught up and end up in trouble. Recognize the principles of infection. Being a beauty professional is not just rewarding. It is also a great responsibility. One careless action could cause injury or spread disease, which is in any abnormal condition of all or parts of the body, its system, or its organs that makes the body incapable of carrying on normal functions. If your actions hurt a client or make them ill, you could lose your license or ruin your salon, spa, or barbershop's reputation. Fortunately, preventing the spread of infection, the invasion of body tissue by disease-causing pathogens is possible when you know proper procedures and follow them at all times. Prevention begins and ends with you. Effective infection control also influences the professional image of your establishment. A client's first impression begins the moment they open the door, so a clean environment should extend beyond each professional's immediate work area. All of the sights, sounds, smells, and textures of the salon, spa, or barbershop meld together to form this first impression, regardless of the number of times a client has previously visited. A clean and orderly business helps build client confidence and trust continuous care is being taken to provide a safe and sanitary environment in which to receive personal services. And this is absolutely true. The way that you need to maintain your, your suite, your salon, your spa, your barber shop is extremely important and it's going to go very, very far. You choosing to not follow sanitary disinfection and obviously practicing infection control in your salon or barber shop, you guys, can lead to you getting in big trouble with the state board. And not just that, where it's going to get around, no one is going to want to come in and get a service by you. All right, now let's talk about modes of transmission. All pathogens are different in terms of where they reside and how they infect humans. Bacteria, viruses, and fungi have different ways of moving from one person to another or from an object to a person. Transmission is the process by which pathogens move between individuals and objects. This is how we get sick. Merely being exposed to pathogens does not make you sick, as your immune system may be able to put up a good fight. However, transmission is the necessary first step in getting sick, and if you prevent transmission, you prevent illness. The most common types of transmission in the salon, spa, or barber shop environment are direct and indirect airborne, and respiratory droplets. 
Direct transmission. Direct transmission is what we most commonly think of in terms of getting sick, as it involves the transmission of pathogens through touching, kissing, coughing, sneezing, and talking. For example, if you shake hands with every customer, every client, and one of them has a cold virus, it can be transmitted to you possibly making you sick if you touch your mouth or nose afterwards. If you fail to wash your hands after each handshake, then you risk infecting all of your customers as well as yourself. Parasitic infections and warts are other examples of diseases spread by direct transmission. Fortunately, diseases spread by direct contact cannot live for long periods of time away from a host. Now let's talk about indirect transmission. So indirect transmission occurs through contact with an intermediate contaminated object such as a razor, an extractor, a nipper, or an environmental surface upon which the pathogen resides. So, doorknobs, phones, food preparation surfaces, or your implements at work are all possible vectors of indirect transmission. In situations like these, someone has contaminated a surface. The pathogen will attempt to infect anyone who touches that surface, making them their new host. Illness transmitted by this method include salmonella, ringworm, and MRSA. Airborne transmission and respiratory droplet. Respiratory droplet and airborne transmission are similar in that transmission occurs when a pathogen living in our respiratory tract is expelled through coughing, sneezing, or even talking. The difference between the two is that respiratory droplets are large particles that do not stay suspended in the air for long. Wearing a properly fitted mask should protect you from these pathogens. In airborne transmission, the particles are much smaller and drier, so they hang in the air longer, allowing for pathogen to spread further. For an example of respiratory droplet transmission, if you have influenza, every time you exhale, your breath carries it, the influenza virus attached to air particles. If you are talking too closely to someone, let alone coughing or sneezing or even yelling, you are also projecting those particles into the other person's airspace. This helps explain why we see more influenza in the winter, when people congregate inside and create an environment conducive to spreading the illness through coughing. Preventing Transmission Infection Control Under certain conditions, coming into contact with harmful organisms can cause infectious diseases. An infectious disease is caused by pathogenic, meaning harmful, organism that enter the body. An infectious disease, however, may or may not be spread from one person to another, depending on the organism and its method of transmission. You guys, in this chapter, you will learn how to properly clean and disinfect the tools and equipment you use so they are safe for you and your clients. Cleaning is a mechanical process using soap and water or detergent and water to remove all visible dirt, debris, and many disease-causing germs from tools, implements, and equipment. The process of disinfection involves the use of a chemical to destroy most, but not necessarily all, harmful organisms on environmental surfaces. Disinfection, however, is not effective against bacterial spores, which are bacteria capable of producing a protective coating, okay? This protective coating that allows them to withstand very harsh environments and to shed the coating when conditions become more favorable to them. 
Thankfully, this type of bacteria is rare and of very little risk in the salon, spa, or barbershop environment. Cleaning and disinfecting procedures are designed to prevent the spread of infection and disease. At a minimum, disinfectants used in salon spas and barbershop must be bactericidal, capable of destroying bacteria, virucidal, capable of destroying viruses, and fungicidal, capable of destroying molds and fungi. Be sure to mix and use these disinfectants according to the instructions on the labels so they are safe and effective. Remember, in some states, disinfectants may still need to be effective against tuberculosis. Check your state board's rules and regulations for compliance information. You guys, if you are not sure where to purchase a disinfectant, obviously you can check out the EPA website and I'm sure you can find a lot of information on there, but most beauty supply stores will sell something like a barbicide, which is what you're seeing on the screen right now. If you are in a pinch and you're trying to get something perhaps online, you are free to check out universalcompanies.com. They sell pretty much everything, anything that you will need for your salon, spa, or barbershop, different types of disinfectants, even disinfectant wipes. Go ahead and check them out. If you've never heard of this website, it's definitely very handy. Prevention one-on-one. -on -one. In general, the risk of infection can be greatly reduced with a few simple steps. What are those? Eliminate pathogens through proper hand washing, cleaning, and disinfection. Clean and disinfect tools and equipment after every service. Keep your skin intact to reduce portals of entry for bacteria. Wear gloves when working with chemicals. Use lotion to reduce your skin from drying and cracking and cover open wounds. Be prepared to turn away clients who show signs of illness. Remember, you are not licensed to diagnose illness or infection. Be sure to refer ill patients to their doctor for a proper diagnosis and treatment regimen. Personal habits, what should those be? It is important to think about your personal habits in terms of how they might increase or decrease the risk of transmitting an illness. For example, if you see 50 clients a week and you shake hands with each of them, you are exposing yourself to everything on the hands of those 50 people every week. It is only a matter of time before you will get sick. However, making a habit of following the rules of proper cleaning and disinfection both in your home and at work will help decrease the odds of falling ill. Hand washing, cleaning, and disinfection are all ways in which you can personally combat the spread of disease and safeguard your health and that of your clients. Identify different types of pathogens. When a disease is capable of being spread from one person to another, it is said to be a contagious disease, also known as a communicable disease. Some of the more prevalent contagious diseases that prevent a beauty professional from servicing a client are the common cold, ringworm, conjunctivitis, which is pink eye, and viral infections. These infections are most often spread through dirty hands, especially under the fingernails and in the webs between the fingers. In many states, you are required to wash your hands prior to every client. But in all states, you must wash your hands after using the restroom and before eating. Contagious diseases can also be spread by contaminated implements, cuts, infected nails, open sores, pus, mouth and nose discharges, shared drinking cups, telephone receivers, and towels. 
uncovered coughing or sneezing and spitting in public also spread germs. Additional terms and definitions related to disease. So let's go over them. The term and definition. Let's start with contamination. It is the presence or the reasonable anticipated presence of blood or other potentially infectious material on an item surface or visible debris or residues such as dust, hair, and skin. Next, we have decontamination. What does that mean? It is the removal of blood or other potentially infectious material on an item surface and the removal of visible debris or residue such as dust, hair, and skin. Next, we have diagnosis. Diagnosis is a determination of the nature of a disease from its symptoms and or diagnostic test. Federal regulations prohibit salon professionals from performing a diagnosis. Why? Because that is not within our scope of practice, you guys. Next, we have germs. Non-scientific synonym for disease-producing organisms. Occupational disease, illness resulting from conditions associated with employment such as prolonged and repeated overexposure to certain products or ingredients. That would be considered a occupational disease. Next, parasitic disease disease caused by a parasite such as a lice and mites. Pathogenic disease, disease produced by organisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. And the last one on this list is toxins, various poisonous substances produced by some microorganisms bacteria, and viruses. When it comes to preventing the spread of infectious disease, beauty professionals must understand and be prepared to deal with five types of potentially harmful organisms. What are those? They are bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, and biofilms. Bacteria. Bacteria are single-celled microorganisms that have both plant and animal characteristics. A microorganism is any organism of a microscopic or sub-microscopic size. Some bacteria are harmful while others are harmless. Bacteria can exist almost anywhere, on skin, in water, in the air, in a decayed matter, on environmental surfaces, in body secretions, on clothing, under the free edge of our nails. Bacteria are so small, they can be seen only with a microscope. Types of bacteria. There are thousands of different kinds of bacteria which fall into two primary types pathogenic and non-pathogenic. Most bacteria are non-pathogenic. In other words, they are harmless organisms that may perform useful functions. They are safe to come in contact with since they do not cause disease or harm. For example, non-pathogenic organisms are used to make yogurt, cheese, and some medicines. In the human body, non-pathogenic bacteria help the body break down food, protect against infection, and stimulate the immune system. Pathogenic bacteria are harmful organisms that can cause disease or infection in humans when they invade the body. Salon, spas, and barber shops must maintain strict standards for cleaning and disinfecting at all times to prevent the spread of pathogenic microorganisms. It is crucial that students learn proper infection control practices while in school to ensure that they are understanding the importance of following them throughout their career. Bacterial infections. There can be no bacterial infections without the presence of pathogenic bacteria. Therefore, if pathogenic bacteria are eliminated, clients cannot become infected. 
Inflammation is a condition in which the tissue of the body reacts to injury, irritation, or infection. Inflammation is characterized by redness, heat, pain, and or swelling. Pus is a fluid containing white blood cells, bacteria, and dead cells, and is the byproduct of the infectious process. The presence of pus is a sign of a bacterial infection. A local infection, such as a pimple or an abscess, is confined to a particular part of the body and appears as a lesion containing pus. A systemic infection is an infection where the pathogen has spread throughout the body rather than staying in one area or organ. MRSA Staphylococci are among the most common bacteria that affect humans and are routinely found in our environment, including on our bodies. Although most strains do not make us ill, staph bacteria can be picked up on doorknobs, countertops, and other surfaces. However, they are more frequently spread in salon spas or barbershops through skin-to-skin -skin contact, such as handshaking, pedicure bowls, or the use of unclean tools or implements, and can be very dangerous. Staph is responsible for food poisoning and a wide range of diseases, including toxic shock syndrome and some flesh-eating diseases. Some types of infectious staph bacteria are highly resistant to conventional treatments such as antibiotics. An example is a staph infection called methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Historically, MRSA occurred most frequently among persons with weakened immune systems or who have undergone medical procedures. Today, it has become more common in otherwise healthy people. Clients who appear completely healthy may bring this organism into the shop with them, where it can infect others. Some people carry the bacteria and are not even aware of their infection. However, the people they infect may show more obvious symptoms. In general, MRSA initially appears as a skin infection, resulting in pimples, rashes, or boils that can be difficult to cure. Without proper treatment, the infection becomes systemic and can have devastating consequences, even resulting in death. Because of this highly resistant bacterial strains, it is important to clean and disinfect all tools and implements used on clients. Additionally, do not perform services if your client's skin, scalp, or neck shows visible signs of abrasions or infection. Microbacterium Microbacterium is the name for a large family of bacteria that is often found in soil and water. In recent years, it has been linked to disfiguring infections associated particularly with pedicure bowls. Because this bacterium may be present in your water supply, it is important to protect your clients by properly disinfecting all implements and bowls. It is also important that both you and your clients keep your skin intact and protected. Avoid cracked skin by using lotions frequently, particularly in the winter months. Advise clients not to shave or wax their legs 24 hours prior to a pedicure. Viruses. A virus is a submicroscopic particle that infects and resides in the cells of a biological organism. A virus is capable of replication only through taking over the host cell's reproductive function. Viruses are so small they can be seen only under the most sophisticated and powerful microscopes. They cause common colds and other respiratory and gastrointestinal infections. Some of the viruses that plaque humans are measles, mumps, chickenpox, smallpox, rabies, yellow fever, hepatitis, polio, influenza, and HIV, which causes AIDS. 
One difference between viruses and bacteria is that a virus can live and reproduce only by taking over other cells and becoming part of them, while bacteria can live and reproduce on their own. Another difference is that while bacterial infections can usually be treated with specific antibiotics, viral infections cannot. Also, viruses are hard to kill without harming the host cells in the process. Prevention. Although we cannot cure viruses, we can often prevent contracting and spreading them through the use of vaccinations. Although there have been several controversies over vaccines in the past, discuss with your physician the vaccines that are recommended for you based on your type of employment, age, and medical history. Along with vaccines, hand washing and disinfection are the best defense against becoming sick with a virus. Incubation and containment. Many viruses can remain doormat for months to years following exposure, but most produce signs of illness within 10 to 14 days. Unfortunately, in most cases, a person is highly contagious in the days just before symptoms appear. This makes prevention paramount in reducing the spread of illness. Containment is achieved when those who are ill stay home, away from work, schools, malls, etc. until their symptoms resolved to the extent that they are no longer contagious. If you believe you have influenza, for example, it is important to see your doctor as soon as possible as the medication used to reduce symptoms is only effective if given in the first 48 hours. HPV and HSV, human papillomavirus and herpes simplex virus, are two highly contagious viruses that can be transmitted both directly and indirectly. Both of these viruses can be spread through skin-to-skin -skin contact and are often thought of as sexually transmitted diseases. However, both viruses can also be spread from person to person indirectly through items like a wax pot because the majority of people infected with these viruses have no symptoms it is even more important to follow good infection control procedures with all procedures that may involve contact with blood and fluids hepatitis and hiv aids disease causing microorganisms that are carried in the body by blood or body fluids such as hepatitis and hiv are called bloodborne pathogens in the salons spas and barber shops the spread of bloodborne pathogens is possible whenever the skin is broken use great care to avoid cutting or damaging the customer's skin during any type of service Hepatitis is a bloodborne virus that causes disease and can damage the liver. In general, it is difficult to contract hepatitis. However, it is easier to contract than HIV because it can be present in all body fluids of those who are infected. In addition, unlike HIV, hepatitis can live on a surface outside the body for long periods of time. For this reason, it is vital that all surfaces that a client comes in contact with are thoroughly cleaned and disinfected. The human immunodeficiency virus, abbreviated HIV, causes acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Abbreviated AIDS, AIDS is a disease that breaks down the body's immune system. HIV is spread from person to person through blood and less often through other body fluids such as semen and vaginal secretions. A person can be infected with HIV for many years without showing symptoms. Some people who are HIV positive have never been tested and do not know they have the potential to infect others. If you accidentally cut a client's skin, the tool will be contaminated with whatever might be in the client's blood, including blood-borne pathogens. You should not continue to use the implement without cleaning and disinfecting it. Continuing to use a contaminated implement without proper cleaning and disinfecting it puts you and others in the salon, spa, or barbershop at risk of infection. Fungi 
are single-celled organisms that grow in irregular masses that include molds, mildew, and yeast. They can produce contagious diseases such as ringworm. Mildew, another fungus, affects plants or grow on inanimate objects but does not cause human infections in the salon, spas, or barbershops. The most frequently encountered fungal infection resulting from hair services is tinea barbie, also known as barber's itch. A person with tinea barbie may have deep inflamed or non-inflamed patches of skin on the face or at the nape of the neck. Tinea barbie is similar to tinea capitis, a fungal infection of the scalp characterized by red papules or spots at the opening of the hair follicles. Ringworm, a fungal infection of the skin that appears in a singular lesion, is another fungus that may contraindicate a beauty service. While all beauty professionals must avoid spreading scalp and skin infections, the increased risk for hair services in particular can be reduced by diligently cleaning and disinfecting clippers and similar cutting tools. Always refer to the manufacturer's directions for proper cleaning and disinfecting methods and recommendations. Yes, yes, I know this is a lot of information, but I hope you're still with me. Now let's talk about parasites. So parasites are organisms that grow, feed, and shelter on or inside another organism while contributing nothing to the survival of that organism. They must have a host to survive. Parasites can live on or inside of humans and animals. They also can be found in food, on plants, and trees, and in water. Humans can acquire internal parasites by eating fish or meat that has not been properly cooked. External parasites that affect humans by way of the skin, including ticks, lice, fleas, and mites. Services should never be performed on a client with visible signs of a parasitic infestation. Always refer the client to a physician for treatment. There are two types of parasites commonly encountered in the salon, spa, and barbershop environment. The first one is Head lice are a type of parasite responsible for contagious disease and conditions. One condition caused by an infestation of head lice is called pediculosis capitis. Next, we have scabies. It is a contagious skin disease caused by the itch mite, which burrows under the skin. Contagious diseases and conditions caused by parasites should only be treated by a doctor. Contaminated countertops, tools, and equipment should be thoroughly cleaned and then disinfected with an EPA registered disinfectant for the time recommended by the manufacturer or with a bleach solution for 10 minutes. Biofilms. Biofilms are colonies of microorganisms that adhere to environmental surfaces as well as human body. They secrete a sticky hard to penetrate protective coating that cements them together. The biofilm grows into a complex structure with many kinds of microbes. The sticky matrix substance holds communities together, making them very hard to peers with antiseptics, antimicrobials, and disinfection, ultimately keeping the body in a chronic inflammatory state that is painful and inhibiting its healing. One action of the biofilm community is to resist the body's defense mechanism. We are learning that biofilms play a large role in disease and infection. Biofilms are usually not visible and must grow very large to be seen without a microscope. Dental plaque is an example of a visible human biofilm and algae colonies on ponds and slime in drains are examples of visible environmental biofilms. In the beauty and wellness world, foot spas can harbor biofilm and require extra attention, especially piped molds. 
Because biofilms are hard to detect, their presence and effects seem to be underestimated. They are one of the most significant scientific discoveries of the past few decades, though we have much more to learn. Consciously using infection control precautions, including standard precautions, cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization is the best method of prevention at the present time. Employ the principles of prevention. Proper infection control can prevent the spread of disease caused by exposure to potentially infectious material on an item surface. Infection control will also prevent exposure to blood invisible debris or residues such as dust, hair, and skin. Proper infection control requires two steps, cleaning and then disinfecting with an appropriate EPA registered disinfectant. When these two steps are followed correctly, virtually all pathogens of concern in the salon, spa, or barbershop can be effectively eliminated. Sterilization, which is the process that destroys all microbial life, including spores, can be incorporated but is rarely mandated. Effective sterilization typically requires the use of an autoclave, a piece of equipment that incorporates heat and pressure. For sterilization to be effective, items must be cleaned prior to use and the autoclave must be tested and maintained as instructed in the manufacturer's specifications. Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC, requires that autoclaves be tested monthly to ensure that they are properly sterilizing implements. The accepted method is called a spore test. Sealed packages containing test organisms are subjected to a typical sterilization cycle, then sent to a contract laboratory that specializes in autoclave performing testing. Step number one. Cleaning. The first step in infection control is cleaning. Remember that when you clean, you must remove all visible and surface dirt and debris from tools, implements, and equipment by washing them with liquid soap or detergent and warm water or a chemical cleaner and using a clean and disinfectant brush to scrub any grooved or hinged portions of the item. When a surface is properly clean, the number of contaminants on the surface is greatly reduced. In addition, proper cleaning removes any oils or residue from items that might interfere with disinfectants being able to work properly. This is why cleaning is an important part of disinfecting tools and equipment. A surface must be properly cleaned before it can be properly disinfected. Using a disinfectant without cleaning first is like using mouthwash without brushing your teeth. It just does not work properly. Clean surfaces can still harbor small amounts of pathogens, but the presence of fewer pathogens means infections are less likely to be spread. Applying antiseptics to your skin or washing your hands with soap and water will drastically lower the number of pathogens on your hands. Do not underestimate proper cleaning and hand washing. They are the most powerful and important ways to prevent the spread of infection. There are three ways to clean your tools and implements, so let's go over them. Washing with soap and warm water and then scrubbing them with a clean and properly disinfected nail brush. Next, using an ultrasonic unit and of course using a chemical cleaner. All right, you guys, so again, I hope you are still with me. Let's now go over the importance of proper hand washing. Properly washing your hands is one of the most important actions you can take to prevent spreading germs from one person to another. Proper hand washing removes germs from the folds and grooves of the skin and from under the free edge of the nail plate by lifting and rinsing germs and contaminants from the surface of your skin. You should wash your hands thoroughly before and after working with each client. Follow the hand washing procedures that is described 
described in your chapter. Something else to keep in mind? When washing your hands, use liquid soaps and pump containers. Bacteria can grow in bar soaps. Now let's discuss antibacterial soaps. While there are many marketing claims on soaps these days, antibacterial and antimicrobial soaps have been under the scrutiny of the FDA since 2014. In 2016, many of the chemicals used in these soaps were banned. What's more, research has shown that repeated use of antibacterial products can actually increase the growth of some of the worst pathogens. The true benefit of hand washing comes from the friction created by the soap bubbles that works to pull pathogens off the skin surface. Repeated hand washing can also dry the skin, so using a moisturizing hand lotion after washing is a good practice. Be sure the hand lotion is in a pump container and not a jar. Avoid using very hot water to wash your hands because this is another practice that can damage your skin. Remember, you must wash your hands thoroughly before and after each service, so do all you can to reduce any irritation that may occur. Now let's talk about waterless hand sanitizers. Antiseptics are chemical germicides formulated for use on skin and are registered and regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Antiseptics generally contain a high volume of alcohol and are intended to reduce the number and slow the growth of microbes on the skin. When there is visible dirt debris on the hands, neither waterless hand sanitizers nor antiseptics will work until the dirt debris is actually removed from your hands. This can be accomplished only with liquid soap and a soft bristle brush and water. Due to the drying effect of alcohol, hand sanitizer should not be overused, but if allowed by your state, they are an excellent option when hand washing is not possible. Never use an antiseptic to disinfect instruments or other surfaces. It is ineffective for that purpose. Be warned that the high percentage of alcohol can dry the skin to the point of causing openings that allow for infectious agents to infect you. With that in mind, only use hand sanitizers as a secondary option to hand washing. Caution! Products and equipment that do not have the word disinfectant on the label are merely cleaners. They do not disinfect. Common antiseptics used in the salon, spa, and barber shops. The first one on the list is hydrogen peroxide, has been used in homes and the beauty industry virtually forever. It is generally used at 3% strength and works well as an antiseptic. However, it should never be used on an open cut as it destroys the cells that began the healing process in a wound. Isopropyl alcohol is effective in cleaning the skin, however, it can be very drying and cause irritation of the skin. Alcohol is not a disinfectant for surfaces or implements and should be used only as a cleaner or antiseptic. Step number two, disinfecting. The second step of infection control is disinfection. Remember that disinfection is the process that eliminates most, but not necessarily all, microorganisms on non-porous surfaces. This process, however, is not effective against bacterial spores. In the salon, spa, and barber shop, disinfection is extremely effective in controlling microorganisms on surfaces such as shears, clippers, and other multi-use equipment. Multi-use refers to items that can be cleaned, disinfected, and used on more than one person. A disinfectant used in the shop must carry an EPA register number, and the label should clearly state the specific organism the solution is effective against when used according to the manufacturer's product instructions. 
Caution, never use disinfectant as a hand cleaner since this can cause skin irritation and allergic reactions. Disinfectants are pesticides and can be harmful if absorbed through the skin. Improper mixing of disinfectants can be weaker or more concentrated than the manufacturer's instructions can significantly reduce their effectiveness. Always add the disinfectant concentrate to the water when mixing it. Always follow the manufacturer's instructions for proper dilution. Safety glasses and gloves should be worn while mixing to avoid accidental contact with eyes and skin. Choosing a disinfectant. You must read and follow the manufacturer's instructions whenever you're using a disinfectant. I think you guys got the point already. Mixing ratios, meaning the dilution, and contact time, which means the time as listed on the product label, require for the disinfectant to be visibly moist to be effective against the pathogens, okay? Are very important and can vary widely based on manufacture and delivery method. So for example, most concentrates have a 10 minute contact time, whereas most wipes, because they do have wipes, have a two minute contact time. In general, as concentration goes up and contact time goes down, disinfectants become more corrosive and damaging to implements. Something else, not all disinfectants have the same concentration, so be sure to mix the correct proportions according to the instructions on the label. If the label does not have the word concentrate on it, that means the product is already mixed, okay, and must be used directly from the original container and must not be diluted. So be sure you read the instructions. All EPA registered disinfectants, even those sprayed on large surfaces, will specify a contact time in their directions for use. Disinfectants must have what's called an efficacy claim on the label. What does efficacy mean? Efficacy is the ability to produce the intended effect. Okay, as applied to disinfectant claims, efficacy means the effectiveness with which a disinfecting solution kills organisms when used according to the label's instructions. You guys, you must follow instructions. So don't go over there and say, oh, I'm going to add just a little bit more or I'm going to do less water or vice versa. Follow the specific instructions. I cannot say that enough. You must follow instructions in order for the product to be effective and work properly. Proper use of disinfectants. Implements must be thoroughly cleaned of all visible matter or residue before being placed in disinfectant solution. Okay, this is because residue will interfere with the disinfectant and prevent proper disinfection. Properly clean implements and tools free from all visible debris must be completely immersed. Okay, meaning you must put the implement all the way in to the solution, just like shown on the video right now, in disinfectant solution. Complete immersion means there is enough liquid in the container, okay, that you're using to cover all surfaces of the item that you are disinfecting, including the handles, for 10 minutes or for the time that's recommended by the instructions, right? When using a spray, wipe, or aerosol disinfectant, you must still look for and adhere to the contact time to ensure that all pathogens on the label are being effectively destroyed. Types of disinfectants. Disinfectants are not all the same. Okay, some are appropriate for use in the beauty and wellness industry and some are not. As beauty professionals, you will primarily be using disinfectants that are effective for cleaning blood and body fluid from non-porous surfaces. Non-porous items, okay, if you're not sure what non-porous means, is basically an item that is made of material that has no pores or openings and that cannot absorb liquids, 
okay? So something that is opposite of non-porous would be something that is porous, material that has holes or openings and is absorbent. So let me give you a quick example of something that is porous. Something that is porous would be a sponge, okay? You would not be able to properly disinfect a sponge, all right, because it has openings. Now, can you properly disinfect a cuticle nipper? Can you disinfect an extracting tool? Can you disinfect your shears? Yes, yes, you can, because they do not have any openings and nothing can actually be absorbed, if that makes sense. Next, quads. What are quads? Quaternary ammonium compounds, also known as quads. They are disinfectants, you guys, that are very effective when used properly on what? Non-porous surfaces. The most advanced type of these formulations are called multiple quads. Multiple quads contain a sophisticated blend of quads that work together to significantly increase the effectiveness of these disinfectants. Quad solutions usually disinfect implements in 10 minutes. As with all disinfectants, leaving tools in a quad solution for prolonged periods of time can cause dueling or damage. So yes, do not leave your implements over the weekend in your quad solution inside of your disinfectant because it could potentially damage them. They should be removed from the solution after the specified period of time. You want to rinse them, then dry it and store it in a clean cover container. Tuberculocidal disinfectants. Tuberculocidal disinfectants are proven to kill the bacterium that causes tuberculosis. In addition to other pathogens destroyed through the use of hospital disinfectants, tuberculosis is a disease caused by a bacterium that is transmitted through coughing or sneezing. It is passed through inhalation only and it is not transmitted by the hands or picked up on surfaces. Next, we have phenolic disinfectants are powerful tuberculocidal disinfectants. However, just because these disinfectants are effective against the pathogen does not mean that you should automatically reach for them. They are a form of formaldehyde and they have a very high pH and can damage the skin and eyes. Phenolic disinfectants can be harmful to the environment if put down the drain. They have been used reliably over the years to disinfect tools. However, they do have significant drawbacks. Phenol can damage plastic and rubber and can cause certain metals to rust. Now let's talk about bleach. Household bleach 5.25% sodium hypochlorite is an effective disinfectant and has been used extensively in salons, spas, and barbershops. Bleach used in salons, spas, and barbershops must be EPA registered as a disinfectant. Chlorine bleach is the only bleach that disinfects, so it is wise to always look for disinfection instructions on the label to ensure that the bleach you use is actually disinfecting. Bleach is corrosive and can damage metals and plastics, as well as cause skin irritation and eye damage. To mix a bleach solution, always follow the manufacturer's directions. Store the bleach solution away from heat and light. A fresh bleach solution should be mixed every 24 hours or when the solution has been contaminated. After mixing the bleach solution, date the container to ensure that the solution is not saved from one day to the next, you guys, but rather disposed of daily like other disinfectants. Bleach can be irritating to the lungs, so be careful about inhaling the fumes. Something else to keep in mind, bleach is not a magic potion. All disinfectants, including bleach, are inactivated 
okay, in the presence of many substances. That includes oils, lotions, creams, hair, and skin. If bleach is used to disinfect equipment, it is still very critical to use a soap detergent first to thoroughly clean and rinse the equipment and remove all debris. Never mix detergents with bleach and always use bleach in a well-ventilated area. Now let's go over some disinfectant tips and safety. Never forget that disinfectants are poisonous and can cause serious skin and eye damage. Some disinfectants appear clear, while others, especially phenolic disinfectants, are a little cloudy. Always use caution when handling disinfectants in addition to the tips below. Always. Always keep the SDS on hand for the disinfectants you use. Always wear gloves and safety glasses. Always avoid skin and eye contact. Always add disinfectant to water when diluting rather than adding the water to the disinfectant. This is to prevent foaming. Always keep disinfectants out of reach of children. Always keep an item submerged in the disinfectant for 10 minutes unless the product label specifies differently. Always immerse the entire implement in the disinfectant if the product label calls for a complete immersion. All right, now let's discuss what you should never do when handling a disinfectant. Never let quad, phenols, bleach, or any other disinfectant come in contact with your skin. If you do get disinfectant on your skin, immediately wash the area with liquid soap and warm water, then rinse and dry the area thoroughly. Never place any disinfectant or other product in an unmarked container. All containers should be labeled with at the least product name, ingredients, date of mixing, and manufacturer's information. Never mix chemicals together unless specified in the manufacturer's instructions. For example, mixing together bleach and ammonia products or bleach and vinegar creates potentially fatal toxic vapors. Disinfecting containers. In the past, jars or containers used to disinfect implements were often incorrectly called wet sanitizers. Disinfectant containers contain disinfectants for disinfecting purposes not for cleaning. The container you choose must be large enough to contain all items to be disinfected and covered, but not airtight. Remember to clean the container every day and wear gloves when you do. Always follow the manufacturer's label instructions for disinfecting products. Keep a log book. Salons, spas, and barber shops should always follow manufacturers' recommended schedules for cleaning and disinfecting tools and implements, disinfecting work surfaces, scheduling regular service visits for equipment, and replacing parts when needed. Although your state may not require you to keep a log book of all equipment usage, cleaning, disinfecting, testing, and maintenance, it may be advisable to keep one. Cleaning and disinfecting non-porous and reusable items. You guys, state rules require that all multi-use tools and implements be cleaned and disinfected before every service. Mix all disinfectants according to the manufacturer's directions, always adding the disinfectant to the water, not the water to the disinfectant, like stated earlier. Follow the cleaning and disinfecting non-porous reusable items procedure that is also described in your chapter. Disinfecting electrical tools and equipment. Hair clippers and other types of electrical equipment have contact points that cannot be completely immersed in liquid. These items should be cleaned and disinfected using an EPA registered disinfectant designed for use on these devices. Caution, electrical sterilizers, bead sterilizers, and baby sterilizers should not be used to disinfect or sterilize implements. These devices can spread potentially infectious diseases and should never be used in salon spas and barber shops. 
Additionally, UV light units will not disinfect or sterilize implements. Most state rules require that you use liquid disinfecting solution. Autoclaves are effective sterilizers. If you decide to use an autoclave, be sure that you know how to operate and maintain it properly. Disinfecting work surfaces. Most states require that all work surfaces be clean and disinfected before beginning a service. Be sure to clean and disinfect table, stations, shampoo sinks, chairs, armrests, and any other surface that the client skin may have touched. Clean doorknobs and handles daily to reduce transfer of germs to your hands. Cleaning towels, linens, and capes. Clean towels and linens should be used for each client, and some states require freshly laundered capes for every service. To clean towels, linens, and capes, launder according to the directions on the item's label. Be sure that the towels, linens, and capes are thoroughly dried. Items that are not dry may grow mildew and bacteria. Store soiled linens and towels in covered or closed containers away from clean linens and towels, even if your state regulatory agency does not require you to do so. Whenever possible, use disposable towels, especially in the restrooms. Do not allow the neckband of capes to touch the client's skin. All states require the use of barrier, such as a disposable neck strip or towels, to prevent the client's skin from touching the neckline of the cape. Multi-use products. So when using creams, lotions, gels, or any other product that is dispensed from a multi-use container, it is important not to contaminate the product. Always use a pump or a shaker to dispense product when possible. For products that are in a tub type container, always use a clean spatula. It can be either a disposable spatula or a disinfectable one to remove the product from the jar, but never use your fingers. Soaps and detergents. Chelating soaps, also known as chelating detergents, work to break down stubborn films and remove the residue of products such as scrubs, salts, and masks. The chelating agents in these soaps work in all types of water. You are still with me, hang in there. We are almost done, we are almost done. Now, let's talk about following standard precautions to protect yourself and your clients. So here we go. Standard precautions are guidelines published by the CDC that require the employer and employee to assume that any human blood and body fluid is potentially infectious because it may not be possible to identify clients with infectious diseases whether or not they look sick, strict infection control practices should be used with all clients. That is true, you guys. In many instances, clients who are just getting sick or are long-term viral carriers are what's called asymptomatic, meaning they show no signs, okay? They show no symptoms or signs of infection. OSHA and the CDC have set safety standards and precautions that protect employees in situations where they could be exposed to bloodborne pathogens. Precautions include proper hand washing, wearing of gloves, and proper handling and disposing of sharp instruments and any other item that may have been contaminated by blood or other body fluids. It is important that specific procedures be followed if blood or body fluid is present. Let's discuss personal protective equipment, also known as PPE. Many chemicals used in the salon, spa, or barber shops bear labels that require the use of personal protective equipment, such as gloves and safety glasses, when working with their products. However, some equipment, such as gloves, offer protection from exposure to pathogens and should be worn whenever practical. Gloves. OSHA defines PPEs as specialized clothing or equipment worn by an employee for protection against a hazard. The hazards this particular standard refers to are bloodborne pathogens such as hepatitis and HIV. 
However, beauty professionals are required to prevent their occupational exposure to any amount of blood, no matter how minuscule, through the use of gloves, mask, and eye protection. Gloves are single-use equipment. A new set is used for every client and at times must be changed during the service. According to the protocol, removal of gloves is performed by inverting the cuffs, pulling them off inside out, and disposing of them into the trash. The glove taken off first is held in the hand with a glove still on it. The glove with the cuff inverted is then pulled over the first glove inside out. The first glove is then inside the second one, which has the service side now on the inside against the other glove, and they are disposed of together. An exposure incident, contact with blood or body fluid. You should never perform a service on any client who comes in with an open wound, a rash, or an abrasion. However, sometimes accidents happen while a service is being performed. An exposure incident is contact with non-intact, in other words, broken skin, blood, body fluid, or other potentially infectious material that is in the result of the performance of a worker's duty. Should the client suffer a cut or abrasion that bleeds during a service, follow the steps that are outlined in this chapter, you guys. As a beauty professional, you will likely work with an array of sharp implements and tools, and cutting yourself is a very real possibility. If you do suffer a cut and blood is present, you must follow the steps for an exposure incident. Demonstrate safe work practices and safety precautions. Water. At the shampoo bowl, be careful how you handle the spray hose. Position the client's head for comfort and access, being cautious of your own body position as well. Do not bend or twist from the waist. As a precaution, always test water temperature on the inside of your wrist before applying it to the client's hair or scalp. The same procedure may be used to test steam towels for facials and shaves. Tools and appliances. Tools and equipment should be placed so that the items are safely stored when not in use yet are accessible when needed. Smaller tools can be placed in countertops, receptacles designed for that purpose. Larger equipment may be mounted under the cabinet, attached to a wall, or set on a shelf. Disinfecting drawers should be set back towards the wall or partition so it does not interfere with other tools. This also limits the risk of accidental spillage of disinfecting solution. Electrical cords can often threaten to become a safety hazard in a busy shop. Cords to clippers, trimmers, curling irons, and blow dryers tend to become twisted and tangled during use. If the cord is too long, it can get caught on the foot or armrest of a chair or table or even on the foot of a client. Never place any tool or implements in your mouth or pocket. Equipment and fixtures. Keep all chairs, headrests, tables, heat lamps, and light fixtures in good working order. Dust and clean regularly to avoid dust buildup and to maintain clean conditions. Maintain light fixtures, change bulbs when necessary to keep all workstations well lit. Ventilation. Proper ventilation and air circulation are extremely important in today's salon, spas, and barbershops. Particles from products such as hairsprays and disinfectants can be inhaled and may cause allergic reactions or other health problems. Vents should be vacuumed or cleaned periodically to prevent any buildup of hair that might impede ventilation. Fumes from chemical applications and nail care products require sophisticated filtration units that cleanse and detoxify the air. Once installed, air filters should be changed or cleaned regularly. 
Exits. Exits should be well marked and identifiable. Employees should know where exits are located and how to evacuate the building quickly in case of a fire or other emergencies. Implement fire drills to practice for this contingency. Next, we have fire extinguishers. Fire extinguishers should be placed where they are readily accessible. All employees should be instructed in fire extinguisher use. And by the way, it is a law that fire extinguishers be checked periodically, be guided by the manufacturer's recommendations and state and local ordinance. All right, next we have attire. Clothing should be comfortable and professional in appearance, you guys. Long hair worn in loose styles may easily get caught in motor vans and other appliances. Keep hair pulled back or short enough to avoid entanglements. Necklaces should be off an appropriate length so as not to get caught on equipment or dangle on a client's face during a service. Shoes should provide good support. Electronic devices that may distract you such as your cell phones or tablets should be kept stored away and checked or answered only in between clients. Children. So children can cause serious risk of injury to themselves in the salon spa or barbershop environment. Post notices and at the reception area, you guys, advising patrons that children are not to be left unattended. Do not allow children to play or climb or spin on the hydraulic chairs. Do not allow children to wander freely uh, around the workstations or storage areas around the workplace. There are many places, by the way, that actually do not allow children to be in unless they're getting a service done. Next, adult clients. As beauty professionals, many other things we do to ensure clients' comfort also fall under the category of safety precautions. As you work through your practical skills, you will learn proper protection procedures and chemical application methods to ensure client safety and comfort from the standpoint of avoiding skin irritation, burns, wet or soiled clothing, and so forth. However, there are other several common sense services that should be performed using good manners and performing common courtesies will help you gain the reputation of being safety conscious and courteous and a courteous professional. You guys assist clients in and out of the chair and onto and off the treatment table when needed. High risk clients. While some customers who know that they have an impaired immune system will share that information with you, many will not because they are embarrassed, do not know it is important, or do not know that they have a compromised immune system. These people are at very high risk of infection should they encounter pathogens because you will not always know who these people are. It is important to practice proper infection control with every customer. Lumpectomy mastectomy patients have had surgical treatments for breast cancer. A part of that surgery involves removing a lymph node in the axilla, which is under the armpit. With those nodes removed, any infectious process in that arm could lead to a permanent condition called lymphedema. It is extremely important to these clients that properly disinfected implements be used particularly in a nail service, to reduce the risk of this very uncomfortable condition. Clients who are pregnant may be particularly sensitive to harsh smells. Their skin may also have unusual reactions to chemicals. Each client must decide for themselves what is safe for their baby during pregnancy. However, allowing a client to read the labels of products prior to using them may help them decide. Your professional responsibility. After studying this chapter, it should be clear that your responsibility as a beauty professional far exceed the ability to perform a good service. Your most important responsibility is to protect yourself, your clients, health, and safety. Never take shortcuts for cleaning and disinfecting. You cannot afford to skip steps in order to save time or money when it comes to safety. It is your professional and legal responsibility to follow state and federal laws and rules. Keep your license current and notify the licensing agency if you have moved or if you've had a name change. Check your state's website monthly for any changes or update to the rules and regulations.
Be aware of your environment so that you can identify and eliminate potential hazardous to make your salon, spa, or barber shop safer for you and for your clients. Be prepared for emergencies. Every salon, spa, and barber shop should have employee and clientele emergency information available. Well, you did it. You got through this chapter. You guys, infection control is extremely important. If you are reviewing this chapter because you are getting ready to take your state board exam, you cannot skip this, okay? You need to know this information. Therefore, regardless of how they ask you the question, you will always know the answer. Yes, it's a lot of information. Yes, it's a lot to listen to, a lot to review, but you did it. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Don't forget to share, like, and if you found the information helpful, send it over, share it with a friend. And if you're not already subscribed, don't forget to do so. As always, let's keep going. Hey, let's keep growing. Let me know in the comments if you made it until the very end. And hey, I'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys.